I would like to welcome everybody to today's Daily Open Chocolate Chat on the Chocolate Life on Clubhouse. My name is Clay Gordon. I'm the creator and the moderator of thechocolatelife.com. And today's topic is Origins Ecuador. And I want to welcome to Clubhouse for the first time and to the Chocolate Life, Jenny Samaniego. Jenny um, is an Ecuadorian or, or lives in Ecuador at the moment um, and um, is both the founder of Conexión Chocolate as well as the founder and co-organizer of the Cacao and Chocolate Summit. Now, I've known Jenny for many years, um, but, I've, but I've never met her in Ecuador. So we've met at a couple of uh, trade shows um, and festivals here in New York City, as well as in Amsterdam. So our connection goes, goes back quite far. And I do know the work that she's done, you know, both um, as a chocolate maker and with the summit, uh, but this is the first time we've also had a chance to talk in a year. So, Jenny, welcome today. Thank you, Clay, and good morning, everybody. So, Thanks Jen, for the introduction, Clay. <laughs> it's my pleasure. Um, so, the, the origin session is our, our opportunities to speak with a chocolate maker and or a cocoa grower um, in the country of origin uh, to explore it. We're all here uh, many of us are in lockdown, travel is restricted, and this is a way for us to, you know, connect to um, countries in the world where cocoa grows. Many people here are either chocolate makers from the bean or they're chocolatiers um, working with chocolate that they buy from someone else. So um, let's dive a little bit into um, the history of cacao in Ecuador. Now, I was there in 2003 and in 2005 on the University of Chocolate Trips which were organized by Pierrick Chouard of Vintage Plantations, now Vintage Plantations Chocolate. And one of the things that I think people think about, the, the main thing that people think about when they think about Ecuador is cacao nacional. But they may not really understand the history of Ecuador as a producing country. So in the late 1800s, during the time, you know, cacao was called uh, the Pepe de Oro, the golden seed, I mean, cacao, uh, Ecuador was one of the world's largest producers, if not the world's largest producer of cacao. So can we sort of head back into sort of the late 1800s and then move forward to sort of understand where we are in terms of modern day cacao? Sure. Well, uh, as you just said, Ecuador has long been recognized as the largest producer of fine flavored cacao in the world. Um, we were uh, the special variety of uh, cacao called Nacional, and um, also known as Arriba Nacional, right? Um, uh, by the 1800s, the cacao produ production skyrocketed to make it the number one producer of cacao in the world to Ecuador. Then in the 19, uh, 1960, and again, 1999, this tragedy struck the cacao farmers of Ecuador with the two plaques in three years, which whipped out uh, over the 70% of Ecuador's cacao produce production. So um, that's when that's when um, researchers, of, researchers, of course, and the government and the people in Ecuador started to think about how they will uh, complement or how they will keep alive the, the cacao that at that point it was only the nacional. So I think the CCN cacao started by then uh, with the research of Homero Castro uh, trying to find a cacao that was strong in a cacao that also was uh, more pro pro productive. And uh, we can say that the CCM 51 came alive to, um, came to the market, they say, to kind of support the the cocoa agriculture in in the country in Ecuador, and uh, this was of course to try to um, uh, overcome, if we can call it like that, 
this fungus unfortunately and uh, by now Ecuador has a, I will call it over a, a 40% of cocoa production, if not more of CCM51 in the country. So in, in, the, in the world of specialty chocolate or craft chocolate, there is this huge struggle and there is this huge debate about CCM51. Uh, many people think of it as the worst thing ever in the cacao industry. Um, and there are major concerns um, in Ecuador and throughout um, South America that farmers are pulling out, you know, heirloom varieties and replacing it for C with CCN51. Or there is concern that if you plant CCN51 anywhere near Nacional varieties, then what will happen is that there will be interbreeding and there will be no longer uh, enough pure uh, Nacional. Um, but at the same time, as you pointed out, um, you know, over the course of a relatively small period of time, and this is historically, my understanding was that there was a plague which reduced um, cacao production in the early 1900s. And that may have been the first one you said. Uh, I, I may have misheard you say 1960, but I thought it was in you know, the 1915 or 1916 or thereabouts. And um, so we see these, we see these diseases, uh, fungal diseases, uh, you know, whether it's um, witch's broom or whether it is a black pod or some other disease attacking the, tr attacking the trees. And there is this tension, I think, um, very importantly between you know, how much cacao does a farmer need to grow in order to be able to support themselves and their families and an industry desire to be able to preserve particular heirloom varieties. Now, as a chocolate maker at Conexion, um, I'm sure this is something that you think about all the time, you know, in terms of what you're sourcing. So how do you, how do you approach this Nacional versus hybrid versus CCN51 in your own, um, in your own sourcing at, at Conexion? Mm -hmm. Well, um... I think I'm a chocolate uh, and cacao uh, passionate person, and uh, it's um, it's difficult actually to say how, as a chocolate maker and also as a person, as an Ecuadorian, we have to deal with this because we understand the importance of keeping the national cacao in the country, but as well we yeah. understand as as, peop as people, you know, that the, the cacao farmer also has to, needs more income. And then is the reality that the CCN cacao is, is highly productive. In comparison, uh, we were having a conversation about two or three weeks ago that we were in a, cacao, in a CCN cacao plantation. We mostly, um, uh, First of all, Conexion Chocolate only dedicates uh, to make chocolate with national cacao. So we mostly visit a uh, national cacao plantations. But uh, two weeks or three weeks ago, as I say, we were visiting this CCN cacao plantation and then we were able to make the comparison. So uh, in a nectar of cocoa, a producer of national cacao makes from 18 to 20 quintals. 25 quintals, mostly of them. And I'm talking about with hey, the... Jenny, can I interrupt quickly? Yes. Um, sure. So I know what a quintal is, but other people in the room may not know what a quintal is. Mm -hmm. Can you compare that in terms of either pounds or kilograms? Sure. So a quintal is 45.45 kilos or 100 pounds. Thanks, Clay. So... Um, to continue, it's the comparison that it happens here is that a cacao producer of national cacao uh, makes from 18 to 25 quintals in, in a nectar of cocoa. But a producer of CCN cacao, when uh, the cacao plantation is, of course, well treated also, they make up to 40 quintals per hectare. So when you think as a chocolate lover that, you know, you want to keep 
growing the CCN, I'm sorry, the national cacao versus thinking as a cocoa producer and in, in their economy. So, you know, you, you, you realize why the cacao producers have been cutting the trees. And it's sad for me <laughs> in a way to say that it's real. So um, you go to areas where um, it, it were all national, maybe 10, 15 years ago, and now you go and all those crops have been changed to CCN cacao. So this, I think this is the big, uh, the big issue now that the country has to deal with. And um, personally, as Jenny Samaniego, no as Conexion, I'm talking about right now. For uh, for me, it's um, I, I wish we could find a way to um, to I don't know to improve potentially the price of the national cacao because indeed there is more and more a. a lost of this variety and of course the the CCN cacao it's um, it's it's being more productive and more produced so this is the big understanding and that we need as an industry to have why the cacao producer is planting the CCN versus the national so that's what's happening and also uh, regarding the price, there is no difference in the price point. So either is national or either is CCM fifty one. The cacao has the same price. And I think that's really an important aspect to to focus on, um, which is that um, CCN is at least two and a half to three times more productive, um, given sort of the same level of labor input and agricultural inputs, whether it's fertilizers or herbicides or pesticides, that given the same amount of work, a hectare of CCN51 will return somewhere between two and a half to three times um, the, um, the, the amount of money to the farmer. And so that the, CC, that, the, that the Nacional Cacao has to earn a price that is at least two and a half to three times what it is that um, they're currently getting for CCN51 or um, if the farmer is going to put more labor into their national farm in order to increase the yields, they need to get that price up as even higher uh, in order to be able to make sure that their income um, is the same as it would be if they produced this other variety. And it is a challenge. I mean, you, you point out very, very rightly, Jenny, that um, the specialty chocolate world has been championing um, this notion of heirloom cacao varieties and understanding their importance. And there is that importance of making sure that we keep them, but there also is this understanding that there is a, an entirely different set of economics. And what we need to do is raise the perception that, okay, we need to be able to charge more for the chocolate that we're making, as well as, so we can in fact uh, pay the farmer what it is um, that they need and earn in order to be able to uh, make the chocolate. So again, so as Conexion, um, how do you um, work with the, the farmers that you source from? You know, so, you know, we're in Ecuador. You're up in Quito, which is up in the north in the hills. Um, you're not far from, you know, you know, you can head over the Andes, so you're right there in the Andes. You can head over to the Amazon Riverside and down into the Amazon River Basin, um, or you can head down towards the coast into so you, you know, Esmeraldas and places like that. So you're not far from these two very, very different growing regions um, in Ecuador. And so, how does that affect um, the way you choose to source your cacao? Right. So. Yes, we are based in Quito, and uh, of course, we're not far from the, the other provinces in, in the country. We travel through most of the country uh, sourcing for national cacao. <laughs> As I say, Nacional is committed to, uh, I'm sorry, Conexión is committed to work only with national cacao. And uh, we travel five to eight hours the most by car 
to visit the cacao producing uh, the cacao producers cooperatives we mostly work with cacao producing uh, cooperatives and uh, some of our uh, cacao farmers are also independent though depending on the region so ecuador has the i, I would say three different type of cacao exporters the big uh, exporting exporters that um, are mostly based in the cost of the country then we have the cooperatives and the cooperatives source the cacao beans from a small scale cacao farmers then that the farmers own from half a nectar to three to through three or five hectares so uh, that's the, the second model. And then now we also have this um, a, a personal or private uh, entities as well that own over a thousand <laughs> hectares of uh, CCN or national cacao. So this is kind of the way how the economy in cocoa is being driven in Ecuador. And as connection, we decided to work only with the cooperatives. And we work currently with, ha with five cooperatives in five provinces of the country. One in Esmeraldas, the second one, the second cooperative, it's in, um, Fort, uh, I'm sorry, Manabi, the cooperative is called Fortaleza del Valle. Then we have another one in Puerto Quito. This is a small group of farmers that they have uh, about 60 to 80 um, cocoa producers. Then we have another one in Los Rios in Vinces. They are about 450 cacao farmers. And then we have one more that we just started working with them last year in Guayaquil. They are over uh, 1,500 cocoa farmers. So we choose each of them because uh, we love the commitment that they have of working with Nacional and also with the small uh, cacao farmers. And also, um, we pay uh, an extra price. Uh, for example, if we look at the market today, the cacao is about uh, $118, but we are paying uh, over 140 to $185 uh, per quintal. So this will depend on the quality of the cacao that we buy, if the cacao has uh, any type of certification, we try to work with organic and fair trade certification. And um, also this will depend as, as well on the season that we buy. And of course, how clean we receive the cacao. And um, another reason why we decided to work with these cooperatives is uh, because of where they are located and uh, depending on the location of the cacao being of course the same national cacao the cacao has different flavor profiles so for example if we talk about the cooperative in Manabí, the altitude of this cooperative is uh, about 350 meters of sea level so this cocoa is super bright, very fruity, and, and, and very floral. We call this cocoa that the aromas and, and the flavors that, this ha this, that it has is kind of, uh, you know, getting a, a bucket, uh, getting some uh, bouquet of a, a pink flower. Though you take the same cocoa. Okay, um, just either Thomas or David or anybody else in the room. Can you About 500 meters above the sea, the aroma, the, the cocoa is still being citrus, is still being fruity, though the flavors and aromas are different, like jasmine, like, you know, like white flowers. So that's the big difference between um, 
the all the cacao cooperatives <coughs> that we work with right now. So, Jenny, um, you did drop out there a little bit, so I'm going to close up some of that space. But I, I, I think we, we, I caught the difference between um, the 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 pink flowers and the white flowers, in, in terms of um, the aroma which comes off the cacao. But when you think about specifically the Nacional Arriba, um, what is the? How would you describe? what you would expect from a pure Arriba flavor. How, how, how would you describe that to people? Because I, sure. I think many people have um, mm -hmm. tasted what is called Nacional, but don't necessarily mm -hmm. have a good um, mental model for what they should be tasting in a, in a, in a pure Nacional. Right. So uh, Nacional, first of all, is fruity. We personally call like uh, fresh fruits. It's also caramelized and it's also floral. It's the only cocoa that we, I, I had the opportunity to taste many chocolates around the world and some of them floral. Though the Ecuador has a very uh, a strong floral aroma in most of them. And uh, I, that's the big difference that we found, we found between, for example, the CCN. So the CCN cacao is indeed highly productive, but that's a clone that it's made to taste only as cocoa or only as chocolate. So while this, you know, national, again, according on the area where the cacao is being grown, you find green bananas, you find uh, pineapple, you, have, you find flowers, uh, you find um, some uh, milk notes on it, caramelized. Uh, uh, so it is very complex in flavor. That's what uh, we found personally on Nacional. I'm talking about mostly of my experience on mm -hmm. making chocolate with these uh, different cacaos, Nacional cacaos from the country. I, as well versus, of course, what, uh, you know, it's been written that national tastes more like. Well, yeah, thank you for that. Well, what I want to r remind everybody is we're about 20 minutes through today's daily open chocolate chat on the Chocolate Life on Clubhouse. Uh, the topic today is Origins Ecuador. My guest is Jenny Samaniego, who is the founder of Conexión Chocolate in um, Ecuador as well as the founder and co-organizer of the Cacao and Chocolate Summit. I do want to remind people who are in the room that I do maintain a story, a post on thechocolatelife.com called The Chocolate Life on Clubhouse. There you can go and find this week's schedule and all past week's schedules, as well as find a link to a resource folder that I maintain on a shared Google Drive that contains links that might have been mentioned during the course of the day, uh, during the course of each room, as well as any documents that get uploaded. And you can use those for reference purposes uh, after, after, um, after a room is over. You can go and get the materials that are uploaded. Um, so Jenny, um, when we think about terms like criollo and forastero, you know, obviously these are Spanish language terms. They are not ones which um, the indigenous peoples would have come up with. Um, now, I have heard a story about where, um, how the word Ariba came to be, because I, I think of Nacional as a, as a type of cocoa bean, but Ariba as a, as a flavor, right? Is that true? I mean, because it often is, you know, cacao, na, Ariba, cacao Ariba Nacional, or some, some combination of those things but not necessarily. All right. Well, um, it's, it, it's a kind of a legend. <laughs> this, um, you know, what happened now, uh, there is that um, in the beginning of the whole history of cacao in Ecuador, it, it was about the 1900th century. Uh, Swiss chocolate Kierk was navigating to the Guayas River in the coastal of Ecuador. So during this trip, he encountered a group of farmers transporting sacks of national cacao that had an unusual rich 
and uh, floral aroma. So and the chocolatier asked the farmers where this cacao had come from. The farmers replied, arriba, meaning up river, and pointed uh, in, in that direction. So that's where actually the arriba name comes from. But the differentiation over here is that the variety is national. Mm -hmm. The name of the variety, while Arriba is kind of the nickname, and it's because of this uh, legend that mm -hmm. it happened. And then um, the national cacao uh, um, is grown through the whole country, but mostly the cacao that grows through the ba through the river in the provinces that are, are around the river. I will say those are the most floral, though the whole national cacao it has this floral aroma. And then the Arriva word comes more t mostly from the, the nickname or the legend. No, that was my understanding is that traders mm -hmm. coming into the port of Guayaquil would be asking, you know, where is the cacao? They would be pointing Arriva, Arriva up river. Um, so up the Guayas River to um, a town that you mentioned already, which is the town of Vinces. And right. um, at, the, at this time, it would have been that area where the most highly prized cacao in the country was sourced. And that's, what people, um, that's why people were interested in finding out where this cacao came from. Right, and if I can share something there that's happening in the country, for example, uh, Vinces is, it's, through the history, we are actually trying to understand as well what happened through the history because uh, Vinces have all trees that get up to 100 years old, but currently Vinces is not really exporting much national cacao in a difference through the other provinces in the country where there are cooperatives or these uh, independent or private cacao exporters that uh, collect the, or export the national. In Vinces there aren't. There was only one cooperative that we are still trying to work with. Unfortunately, the, the model is not working well for them. But after, uh, be, besides them, you don't find many people that are trying to collect the, the cacao in the national cacao in Vinces. So, most of the cacao in Vinces is being sold right now as a market cocoa and mixed with the CCN cacao. We were able to find this because we are managing the Harlem Cacao Preservation Project in Vinces. We started managing after the cacao farmers in that region received the notification of having these heirloom cacao varieties. So now we've been for over two years on um, working on the project. Uh, this project for people that doesn't know what heirloom cacao does is find uh, special cacao varieties of uh, cocoa around the world. And they sent uh, some samples of leaves for analysis of the genetics and they do also organolepid testing profiles and when they found that this cacao is good for replanting or reproducing they will support the project in country so that's where we are right now we have gone through a huge process but uh, currently we are replanting about a nectar of these heirloom cacao varieties in Vinces. So understanding what's happening or the situation in, in Vinces, we are thinking that we will put our own collection center uh, of national cacao mm -hmm. in, in the uh, area or the uh, Los Rios, in the province of Los Rios in the area of Vinces. So I think that's uh, also important to understand this and these big issues at the end in the mm -hmm. country that, you know, once we are out of, of the country, we don't know. If we look at the, um, 
If we look at the sort of history of the modern history of cocoa in Peru, uh, one of the things that we find is that, you know, the U.S. development effort um, to convert coca farmers into cocoa farmers uh, sort, sort of pushed uh, high productivity cacao in Peru. And so there is this tension between the indigenous varieties and the introduced CCN variety. But that was a result of sort of a direct um, government decision uh, you know, because Minagri, the Ministry of Agriculture, would have helped determine how that money got spent. Um, is the Ecuadorian government, you know, what is their level of concern about the preservation of the heirloom varieties or are they mostly interested in productivity? Well, that's a great question. We are actually having meetings with the government, weekly meetings to uh, even name right now. Clay, as some of you actually may know, the ICO, the ICCO, it's, uh, has reached the countries to try to define now the different type of fine flavor cacaos or the different type of cacaos that the countries are producing. So now, currently, we're in the debate of how do we call the CCN cacao <laughs> and or how does the country it's going to um, to call uh, our our cacao worldwide. So uh, it's we're, we're in the debate. Shall we call it the national cacao or shall we call the country of a, a producing country of fine flavor cacao or a fine cacao? If we decide go to go, if the country actually decides to go for fine cacao, it's because now the most uh, production of cocoa comes from the CCM 51. So it's kind of a super uh, special strategy now that the country has to think through. Mm -hmm. But um, we see uh, that there is a big um, division that you must know between the CCN cacao producers and the national cacao producers. We also have to understand a big difference over here that impacts in the economy of the producers and of course the country and the decision that the country turns taking. And it's because mostly the producers of CCN cacao are um, people with a good economy. And I'm talking about the, that there are farming or farms I'm sorry, that owns from 100, 500, 1,000 hectares of, of CCN cacao versus that the national cacao is still being planted or kept by producers of, uh, as I say before, half an hectare to five hectares. You will find out there few producers that believe on the national that have 100 or 500 hectares of the new national cacao varieties. Though this is the big issue I think that the country is having right now. So we are, uh, for what the government and it's looking is to create a new system of calling sustainable cacao. So trying to, uh, to put together in this group all types of cocoa and not defining the um, um, the name of from, for fine or fine and flavor cocoa. So that's the only strategy that right now we're seeing from the current government. Uh, if we go back maybe 10 years ago with the ex-president Rafael Correa that we have, he, um, he actually uh, incorporate a plan for the regeneration or restructure of the national cacao in the country. So this president indeed put a big plan that um, the Ministry of Agriculture had to work directly with the cacao cooperatives or even directly with the small individuals in order to educate them and make them uh, uh, understand the importance of keeping the national cacao. And also it was a budget put it on to support some of the efforts, like helping with um, uh, PODAS, I forget the name <laughs> in English, 
eh, eh, helping cleaning the cacao plantations of the producers and also uh, supporting or giving the cacao producers the new cacao variety, the, na the new national cacao, and as well um, helping them or teaching them about the technical ways of planting cocoa because, you know, planting cacao, uh, either, either national or CCN, you need to have it, a structure and you know, methods to make a productive cacao plantation. So that's what's currently happening in Ecuador. The USDA um, le, uh, let, I will say, in the previous government. Now we, we know that the USDA is also trying to come to the country, uh, even though uh, in a big difference from what's happening, for example, in Peru that you just mentioned, which I consider is a huge, uh, huge help and um, has a great potential and either also Colombia as well, I think was in the same program of the USDA is that, you know, planting cacao for, for cocoa. And now uh, Ecuador is having the same issue in the area, in the province of Esmeralda as the one that borders with Colombia directly. And we were hoping as we have some farmers over there as well to see how these uh, projects will support those areas that are mostly uh, you know, affected by, unfortunately, the, 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 the mil militia, we call it, and um, is that they don't want to support the pro uh, the, those type of projects in this area in, in mm -hmm. Ecuador. So we're really trying to understand why is that if, you know, in Peru and also in Colombia, and this money and these resources are coming to help uh, this type of project while in Ecuador is not happening that. So that's where we are right now. No, and I think that, you know, stepping back uh, and looking at it, um, you know, number one, I think it's good that um, the government is engaged. Um, when I was down in Bolivia uh, in 2010, 2011, um, the government was not engaged um, in part because that was just, you know, Evo Morales and his style of government. He refused um, any kind of international aid from the United States and um, was very, very much uh, about um, listening, um, about, um, about keeping a hands off policy and letting the, um, letting the big cooperative, which was running, which was running the El Sabo chocolate factory, just do what it is that it did. But I want to I want to sort of move slightly, if I can. Um, one of the things that happened um, with the USAID's involvement in Peru is they created a big supply of cacao without creating a demand for it, and that's how the Salón del Cacao y Chocolate came to be. They needed to create worldwide demand uh, for the cacao that they were growing. But another interesting aspect of what the Salon did was that they wanted to focus on local pride in the quality of the chocolate that was being made. And so at the same time they are selling and promoting cacao around the world, they're also um, promoting the idea of chocolate being made in country and for Peruvians to have pride in the chocolate that's being made in country. So in Ecuador, um, is there any real sense um, or you know, what is the general sense that you know, an Ecuadorian would have um, about um, the, the, the chocolate that is being made in Ecuador? So if you look at what you're doing, you look what Oja Verde is doing, Toac, Picari, you know, how, or, and others, how, you know, how is, the, um, uh, how is the, the local consumer, have their thoughts about chocolate changed in the last 10 years? All right, I, it's a great question. This goes with the culture. I think Ecuadorians, we don't have a sweet tooth. <laughs> and that's, that's something that in every, uh, in every town and, or in every province where you are, in clay you that has, have visited Ecuador, you will realize that people mostly will have lunch at what we call lunch. <laughs> it's lunch, the meal call also in the country, which the meal is a, a, a plate of soup and a main course, 
and then uh, an squeeze juice. But you will see and you realize that mostly the people don't have a dessert. And um, in some areas on the country, you will drink a hot chocolate maybe, but the hot chocolate that has maybe 15% of cocoa and then the rest of sugar, vanilla, and etc. One uh, mainly of these, uh, you know, brands of like Nestlé or La Universal, local. La Universal is the local brand. So um, I think everything starts through uh, from from here. And then um, in the last century, if we call it, or um, I will say mostly the last five years, actually, in, in Ecuador, uh, where the boom of the chocolate starter with these new chocolate companies, we have been doing a huge efforts trying to educate our own Ecuadorians on the importance of our cacao worldwide and trying to uh, trying to create new products that are made with national cacao or with a fine flavor cacao to get to their palates. And I will say that is being a big effort, and I'm not sure if it has been effective yet. We see every time that we have more chocolate lovers, though people still don't know why our, our cacao is important in the country. So we had uh, the Salon de Chocolat, uh, it was a local initiative it is mm -hmm. not internationally as like the one that happened in Peru it didn't have much impact now the government is also trying to um, educate the consumer though we don't have yet a national plan or a national communication uh, that reach that information through the whole country so for example, in the case of TOAC that you just mentioned, or, or our own case, we make chocolate in the country, but we still supply internationally. And from the 100% of our production and sales, we are 99.5% exporting our products. And uh, I will, uh, even our 5% is a little too much. Uh, for our, our sales here in the country. And I think that's the same case from most of the cacao, I'm sorry, from most of the chocolate companies that are making, uh, you know, fine flavor, uh, good quality, uh, uh, high cacao content chocolate. Yeah, when I was when I was there on my trip in 2003, I think we went and visited Equacoco down in Guayaquil. So this is one of the largest industrial candy producers in the country. And you, what they said is the way we approach making a new product is we say, you know, our average customer is going to walk into the local store um, with a, a U.S. quarter in their pocket. And for people who don't know, the official currency of Ecuador is, in fact, the U.S. dollar. And so you can leave the United States and go to Ecuador without having to exchange anything. And, mm -hmm. and um, um, you know, it, it, it's easy in that respect. But they think about you know, what it is that their customer has in the way of resources. So they say to ourselves, what can we make that we can sell for a quarter, right, so that somebody can go and buy it? But when t talking about this culture aspect, Jenny, I think it's, it's really, really interesting. So when I'm down in Mexico, you know, cocoa, a cacao, uh, you know, is such an important part of the history of Tabasco um, that it's everywhere. And when I was in Ecuador on my trips in 2003 and 2005, in one of them we went to the market in Otavalo. And although it is a, a fairly touristic craft market, um, you do find, you know, iconography, you know, heading back into the cultural history of Ecuador. And, you know, it was surprising to me that while I might see... Um, uh, woven in llamas and um, things having to do with maize and other foods that are culturally important. Um, I never saw a cocoa pod decorating anything. And there's, I th you know, I'm, I'm sort of wondering about that, that 
cultural context and how it how it affects people's approach to uh, consuming chocolate in the country because it's just not as important as it is right. in neighboring countries. Right, and um, I think you just pointed out something important here that I was about to mention. Also, I think um, you know. I, I, I will say it's a little unfortunately, though the, our Ecuadorians appreciate more what's, what comes internationally. So the brands that comes from outside. And that was uh, something that the previous government tried to, um, to kind of make us understand the, our own value. Like, what the, the the things that we're producing because we don't produce only cocoa or chocolate we we have beautiful um handcraft uh, shoes uh, bags cloth so the con the previous government were saying like you know let's let's produce things in ecuador let's use here let's buy it here and let them let let's export though now things have of course switched but um, you will see that, for example, with an international brand, and I'm going to put some examples here, for example, Republica del Cacao is a local brand indeed, but it's been driven from Barrona or uh, subsidiaries, which is an international brand. And the management of this institution is uh, international. The people from France are managing the brand over here. So once you go, like for example, in our own case, Connexion Chocolate, we have won over 35 awards in the International Chocolate and as well in the Academy of Chocolate. So if we go with our chocolate that we consider is a good quality to talk to a chef or a chocolate here in country, uh, we're, we're not gonna be even well here versus when international comes to sell to our own people. So I think that's what, mm -hmm. that's part of the big problem or the big issue in the country that we still don't value or understand our, um, our, own, our own work, I will say, or what we have. So we still value more what comes from outside. Yeah, for those of you who may not know, um, Republica del Cacao, uh, one of the um, original um, international management was a gentleman by the name of Bernard Duclos, and Bernard ran Valrona's business in the United States for many, many years. And so even from the very beginning, Republica Cacao had this connection internationally. Um, and then after many years, Valrona actually um, um, took over the company, bought them out. But you talk about, you know, branding and, and international, um, you know, international things being international brands being preferred over domestic brands, I think that you know, perhaps the most iconic version of that um, is the Panama hat. You know, the Panama hat doesn't come right. from Panama, it comes from Ecuador. And if you wanna get the best Panama hats in the world, you go to Cuenca, I believe, uh, if I remember. And there is in fact a, mm -hmm. a, a, a protected designation of origin, a geographic indicator. So Panama, the, the, that hat um, is actually um, listed in the, World International uh, World Intellectual Property Organization listing as a very very special specific kind of of article, and yet it is referred to by the name of another country. Right, right, and the same thing happened, for example, with coffee, and uh, you know Juan Valdez, for example, now that is a huge brand of Colombia's coffee. Um, a big percentage of that coffee is. Uh, exported from Ecuador to Colombia, but what I also came to find out, it was surprising for me, was that uh, Ecuador has a very high cacao, uh, I'm sorry, coffee quality that sometimes uh, is transported to Colombia and um, being sold in between their higher, uh, the higher ca coffee qualities. So, in, in, you know, we, we as Ecuadorians have this huge uh, opportunities to um, produce and to sell locally and internationally as well and we're not doing it so yeah that's that's a unfortunately a big issue that we have right. here right. it's it's ironic somehow that Ecuadorian coffee can get more value when it's sold as Colombian coffee 
you know, <laughs> you know, why, 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 why can't you take that same coffee and say it's from Ecuador and get the same price? But there is a market perception um, outside, perhaps specialty exactly. coffee, about what it is that goes on, of you know, about you know the positioning of it, which I think is just you know, which is a part of a sort of a fund- fundamental ex- understanding of how countries market and brand themselves and um, you know, how they can create uh, markets and then increase the value for uh, the, the products that they charge. I mean, you, you point out Juan Valdez. Juan Valdez is probably one of the greatest agricultural marketing programs um, that's ever been in mm-hmm. existence. You know, Prom Peru, right, has, is just, you know, really, really fabulous. It has one of the best brands in the world and they're known for being able to do just amazing, amazing work. And for some reason, Pro Ecuador, which is the export export um, agency in the country, it hasn't managed um, the same level of brilliance. But what I want to do now is um, change topic again. We have about 10 minutes left in the regularly scheduled program today. And tell us about the Cacao and Chocolate Summit. So how did it come to be? Um, You have one coming up in a couple of weeks. And who are, you know, what are you expecting to be able to, um, for, if somebody wants to register, um, what they could be expected to learn from the summit this year. Sure. So the Cacao and Chocolate Summit came as our own private initia- initiative, um, staying, um, spending a good, quiet, good time in the cacao plantations. We understood that the information that the people out there had about cacao and agronomy and a different type of education was really getting to the small cacao producers. So the first summit was in 2019 when Carla Martin, uh, we actually met with Carla Martin and Carla Martin was giving the, the small cocoa producers. Though it escalated a little bit more and we were able to actually bring together ma- many sectors of the of the industry, including cacao producers, chocolate exports, scientists, industry experts, government representatives, and also chocolate makers. And it was a huge, uh, it had a huge impact in the country because it was the first time where we were able to talk of the current opportunities and challenges of the fine chocolate industry in Ecuador. And it was amazing to have in the same panel uh, the cacao producers uh, next to the chocolate makers talking about what's important for each of them. So uh, the goal in, uh, of the cacao and chocolate summit uh, indeed is to elevate the fine chocolate industry in country and of course uh, grow consumer d- demand uh, locally and internationally as well. That's how it came to be, and in the 2000, um, so 2000, I'm sorry, I said 2018 was the first event, 2019 was the second event, and we were going to make it as well locally, but actually we, I'm sorry, (laughs) I'm kind of confused with the date, so 2019 was the first event, 2020 we were going to make locally, but of course with the pandemic we weren't able to do it. And then we we made it um, online, a, a virtual edition, and now we're doing it the third edition. So this time we are, uh, we're having the topic of building markets for fine cacao and chocolate. So uh, we realized that it were many efforts from many different institutions of getting education out there to the through the farmers, but we saw that it was a gap. And the gap was that it wasn't any connection for the uh, cacao and chocolate producing countries to hit uh, the market. So now what we're trying to do uh, in the new summit is getting information out there on all the things that take to a producer to get into the different markets. That's what uh, we're gonna be doing. Uh, the Cacao Summit is gonna be on May 26 and 27. It's going to be an online event. And we're gonna be sending the link. It's gonna be uh, with the previous registration. We will be uploading 
the link uh, during this week or early the next one. It's a free event that everyone can uh, sign up. And um, uh, that, that's it, I think, about most of the Cacao Summit. And just to let everyone know, if you do go to the post, the Chocolate Life on Clubhouse, and follow the, um, the link to the resource folder and this week's calendar, there is a link to the Cacao and Chocolate Summit website so that you can check and you will be able to see the link um, there, the registration link if you want to join. Um, also, I've put um, the Instagram account for the Cacao and Chocolate Summit on that page. And you can follow that and follow the Cacao and Chocolate Summit account on Instagram and get notifications for uh, updates to updates to the summit in your Instagram feed as well. And while we're here, um, what I would like to suggest is that um, people look around the room. If they find people who are in the room who may be new, welcome them to the room, uh, connect to them on Instagram or on Twitter so that you can DM them if you have questions about who they are, but find a way to grow the, the community here, and I would appreciate that. Um, I do have links um, to be able to send to people which sort of bypass the entire waiting list process um, and join a specific room. So if there are people you think that would love to become a member of the club and might be, part, might be interested in participating in a particular room, uh, let me know and what I can do is I can give you a link that can be used to join directly to the room and bypass the clubhouse waiting list. Uh, which is what we did for Jenny. Jenny was having trouble signing in yesterday, and I was able to bypass the waiting list and get her uh, get her into today, um, uh, like almost immediately. So, yes, David. Yeah, and, and just to note that Android is now open from yesterday afternoon. Ah, okay, that's good to know. And we got an update. So it's out of beta and into general release. Yeah, it's not every Android. Android phone, but it's most of them. So lots of rooms are welcoming Android users today. Um, that's good to know. Thank you very much. I will certainly post it to people and let them know that they can get down on Android. I mean, this is good news for me because many of the people I wanted to invite into this Origins conversation say, I'm only on an Android phone and I can't join you until um, they opened up the Android release. And so I've been talking to um, some people in Kenya as well as some people in Costa Rica um, and other parts of the world. And so I'm really, really excited about that release. Um, people should also know that they did... Um, to push a new release yesterday um, for the iPhone client. And one of the things that you'll see is if you go to the calendar of um, future events, there's now a bell icon and notification icon. So if you click on the notification icon, the bell icon next to a room that you are interested in, what you will do is you will actually be notified um, when the room opens. So it's a really, really good reminder. And I recommend that people um, go and um, go take a look at that new feature. Um, and if you have friends who were on Android to be able to suggest that now's the time to join. And again, if anybody has a particular person that they would like to join, uh, let me know and I can forward a link to them. Uh, I want to um, point out, um, finally, before we close the room today, is that um, if there's anybody who's in the audience who has a question for Jenny, um, please uh, raise your hand and we'll move you up. Um, there's been a lot of interesting discussion about um, sort of the history of cacao in Ecuador, um, some of the modern situation of cacao, but I think a little less focus on, you know, Jenny, how you came to cocoa and chocolate and what the current business of Conexion is, but connection in, with, re, with, in, um, with respect to the entire industry. I mean, I personally, personally found it very interesting that, um, that the majority of your customers are outside of Ecuador. And I think that from what I know of Toac, that is certainly true. Um, my understanding of Picari is that they have an export line and a line which is less expensive, which is available in country. So, but as a general rule, are Ecuadorian consumers, do they care about certification? Does your average Ecuadorian care about fair trade or do they care about organic? Is that a dynamic within the country? Jenny? I will say that this is happening with the new generations. You will see mostly people under 30 years that they are now caring about all of this, not only in chocolate, 
but mostly in, in any type of products. Uh, regarding the certifications for the other <laughs> a type of, uh, for the other um, people, I will say all, uh, older than this age, the, for the people that are mostly in the agricultural business and um, international business, we are aware of it. But uh, then locally consume, I think it's still difficult for people to understand the importance of these certifications. So uh, is this under 30 a market that you're talking about also more interested in consuming Ecuadorian chocolate products manufactured in Ecuador? Are the two, do the two go hand in hand? That, that's a great question. <laughs> that's a great question. Um, that's something that I'm not going to be able to answer you well. I think um, the biggest efforts that we, we've seen over here in food is uh, with vegetables and with other different type of agricultural products, most than with uh, chocolate itself. So that, uh, it's interesting. I know that Ecuador is a very large producer of flowers for export, particular roses. Mm -hmm. And there have been long-standing concerns about the environmental um, environmental impact because that's a very um, fertilizer-intensive kind of industry. Um, but there's also an organic rose industry that's growing, or an organic flower industry that's going out of Ecuador. So it will be interesting to see how those concerns, if in fact they come together, for cocoa and chocolate. I'm you know, I'm I'm, I'm hopeful, but I don't necessarily know that that will happen. Um, so one last question. Uh, I know that there is a there is a an association of cocoa producers, so uh, which is called Anna Cacao, and for many many years they had something called the World Chocolate Summit every August. I think it was. Um, so how do you think what it is that you're doing with the Cacao and Chocolate Summit um, complements what it is that is has been done with Anna Cacao? in the World Chocolate Summit. Do you see similar concerns or are you really focusing on a different audience in a different part of the market? All right, so I think that's what we're doing is focusing in different type of audience on the market. When uh, we personally as Conexión try to attend the Anne Cacao, Cacao and Chocolate, um, I'm sorry, Cacao Summit as well, I think it's called, um, we had to pay for one day $350 price for the entry to the event. So that for us was, uh, you know, quite of expensive, even, uh, even if we mostly export our products. We had to understand that in Ecuador, the basic salary is $400. So paying uh, $350 for an entry to the event, it was... Um, it was very hard and we understood, uh, as I say in the beginning, we understood at that point that there was the big glitch of information getting only to certain point of the industry but not to the other part of the industry. So that's when the initiative actually took place in trying to get with the information to everybody and making it free for everybody that wants to access the information but mostly focus on the cacao producers or in the cacao cooperatives and uh, fortunately I will say in, in, in this case that you know this became also virtual and that anybody can access now to the information also because all the information we're putting is being uploaded in, in the website. So that's the big difference that we have, Clay. You know, thank you for c clearing that up for me. It, it was what I suspected. But with respect to the Cacao and Chocolate Summit, are some of the rooms in English only, some of the rooms in Spanish only? Are, is there translation for people who might not understand Spanish? Thanks, yeah, I forgot to mention that, but it will be English and Spanish translation. So if you are an English speaker, you will just uh, sign into the English uh, English room, and also if the speaker will speak in Spanish, you will be listening in English. Great, thank you, thank you very much for clearing that up. I mean, certainly, I mean there, are, I, I I know the barriers of language. I mean, I I travel 
fairly regularly um, to Spanish speaking countries, but I, I'm not, you know, deep <laughs> in it enough and often enough so that, you know, I lose the vocabulary and I lose the nuances. And so while I might get a high level understanding of what's going on, as long as people are talking about cocoa and chocolate, right? I have a, but the moment they start talking about something else, I have, you know, I have trouble following along with what it is that's going on. <laughs> anyway, I want to thank you, Jenny, for spending um, the hour with us. I appreciate um, um, learning what it is that you had to say um, and your being willing to join in um, with us. I mean, I, I contacted you on Instagram over the weekend and you said, yes, yes, I want to go and join and do this. And we had not just the, your willingness, but you're willing to jump onto a new platform for the first time and try things. So I just want to say thank you very much for that.